Good evening, everybody. Is this microphone working? Can you hear me at the back all right? Um, welcome to what is the um, October monthly lecture meeting of the Society of Antiquaries of Newcastle upon Tyne. Welcome to our members, but also welcome to um, others in the audience, members of the public, because this is our annual public lecture held in collaboration with Newcastle University. And um, I'll just start by making um, an obvious appeal, really, which is um, those of you who are not members of the society, if you like what you hear tonight, if you find it interesting, if you would um, like to know more about the acti activities of the society, if you would like to be able to borrow books from its historic library in the Great North Museum, um, if you want to know more about its collections held in the Great North Museum, do consider becoming a member. Anybody can join. You don't have to be nominated or anything like that. Um, there is a website, just Google Society of Antiquaries of Newcastle on Tyne. Don't join the London lot by accident. Make, <laughs> make, make, make sure it is the uh, Newcastle Society. Find out more about us and um, get involved, I I please, if, if you would like to. Um, those of you who are members of the society will know that um, I am a past president of the society, not its current president. Um, David Heslop, the president, uh, gives his apologies. Um, he's been offered a free trip to Italy and has um, obviously thought that would be better than being here. Um, and before I get on to the main business of the evening and introduce our speaker, I just have a few brief um, housekeeping uh, notes. Um, if you have a mobile phone, get it out now and turn it off or put it on to silent. Um, please, all phones on silent. Um, no fire alarm is expected, so if one sounds, it is real. Uh, please follow the instructions of the event stewards and make your way out of the building to the car park. If, if you would like to tweet about tonight's lecture, please tag at InsightsNCL and at NCL Antiquaries. And following the lecture, the speaker has consented to answer a few questions. Um, but if you have a question um, and you have your hand up and you're picked, please wait for the microphone to get to you uh, before asking your question so that everyone else can hear you. Well, it's my great pleasure um, to introduce Pam Graves. Now, Pam um, did her PhD on religious practice in later medieval churches in Norfolk and Devon, uh, based in the archaeology department at the University of Glasgow. Um, but following that, her working life from uh, over a decade, 1988 until 1995, was in urban archaeology um, in York, in Lincoln, in Leicester and in Shrewsbury. But um, what she considers to be a turning point in her career was when she was taken on by Newcastle to work on the um, Newcastle-upon-Tyne archaeological assessment with uh, Dave Heslop, a collaboration that resulted in a magnificent volume, um, still in print, still available, uh, it will be known to many of you, Newcastle upon Tyne, The Eye of the North, an archaeological assessment, which was published in 2013. Uh, and that was the beginning of a collaboration with Dave Heslop on aspects of urban archaeology, um, which continues to be productive and innovative. 
She was appointed uh, to a lectureship at Durham University's Department of Archaeology in 1996, and that is where she still is, and where she continues to develop aspects of both urbanism and religious life, as well as um, engaging in artifact studies in both her research and her teaching. So tonight, uh, uh, Pam Graves' chosen title is The Way, the Word, and the Water, Aspects of the Archaeology of 17th Century Newcastle. Pam. Thank you very much, Nick. And thank you. I'd like to thank both the Society of Antiquaries of Newcastle and Newcastle University for inviting me here tonight. So the way, the word, and the water. Oops, this right. This is the source of the, um, the quotation. They have a very advantageous proverb amongst them, Newcastle people, which is that they pay nothing for the way, the word, nor the water. For the ministers are maintained, the streets paved, and the conduits kept up at the public charge of the town. Now, I have a confession. When I put my abstract together, I was going to cover three topics. <laughs> um, but that was entirely overambitious. So I'm not covering the Stoke Ledger. I'm not covering the conduits. But I am covering uh, the first aspect that I said I would, which is... Um, a group of the, the mid-17th century merchant houses on Sand Hill, which I'm sure are so familiar to this audience. I'm going to suggest that they, they bear aspirations to present an ideological allusion to the New Jerusalem, um, hoped to be created by a group of Puritan-leaning merchants in the period of the Commonwealth, specifically the 1650s. And there is no uh, lack of the words in this, but there is also a relevance for the way, because these buildings and these people also, in a sense, created what we would call a streetscape. And they were also very concerned with how people behaved morally and physically, in a sense, in that streetscape. So it's an exercise, if you like, in taking a new look at something we might think we're very familiar with. The political and religious symbolism of buildings is of enduring interest in historical archaeology. Similarly, concepts of the ideal in urban planning and utopian communities are subjects of study. This paper wants to move beyond iconography and ideology to suggest how a new post-Civil War English urban elite tried to implement a policy of reforming their town as the New Jerusalem. A group of merchant houses reveals an attempt to build scripture into the very physical environment and establish the identity of the elite as elect watchmen over the lives and souls of the townspeople. And contemporary sermons are integral to the analysis, as are the agency and interrelationships of a tightly knit social group. So this is my structure. I'm going to look briefly at some physical aspects of these mid-17th century houses that um, uh, caught my attention, introduce you to some Protestant theological ideas about towns and the elect from the 16th and 17th centuries, and introduce you in particular to the work of Dr. Robert Jennison, who was a preacher in Newcastle um, in the 1620s and 30s and into uh, 1652. And I want to, or it's incumbent on me really, to demonstrate the close-knit relationship between Jenison and the people who occupied the Sand Hill buildings in the 1630s to 1660s, and who were therefore in a position to be able to remodel and reface them in the 1650s. And then we'll look in more detail at some very specific iconography and ideas that tie these themes and people together. So this map um, 
is there to remind us that these timber framed buildings or timber framed buildings in general were used throughout the early modern town. But the signature mid to late 17th century structures in Newcastle are typified by the surviving buildings at number 32. Ooh, look, wrong thing. Oh, I knew I'd do that. Got ya. <laughs> Sand Hill. And these however, illustrate the type of building that was once found not only on Sand Hill, but also in a few examples in other parts of the Quayside, the Side, and possibly other major streets within the town. They've been the subject of study by Grace McCombie and Dave Heslop, and Dave, um, Abby Antrobus, and I worked on 33 to 34 for a couple of years. The Sandhill frontages of Bessie Surtees house and numbers 33 to 34 Sandhill are structured with simple post and rail or post and bresimer frames with brick filling the panels beneath. However, the posts and rails form wide window casements or ranges which dominate those elevations um, on three floors. And I'll come back to that. So they are seemingly continuous and give the impression of a unifying, though not uniform, facade. These house fronts were built around 1650, and both houses and furnishings show evidence of a major local industry, aware of wider artistic developments, but working within a local social context. And it's not the purpose of this paper to dwell on the implications of the interior arrangements in death, but rather to concentrate on the building's decoration and role in defining exterior urban space. And the authors of Pesner 1992 said that the whole treatment is apparently without parallel in England. Um, the original window jams of 39 to 40 Sand Hill um, are Fair, seem to be fairly well followed in the 19th restoration of Ber Bessie Surtees' house next door. So in these, they're picking up on the direct design. Um, and these pilasters or jams of the windows are like flattened columns, if you like, that's the way to think of them. And they've got very simple Doric capitals and bases. But uniquely, as far as I'm aware, the vertical flutes, which would normally be... Uh, hollowed or concave cuts or, or would be concave cuts are actually protruding staffs or pikes or lances and I'll, I'm going to be coming back to those. Numbers 33 to 34 Sandhill demonstrate similar facades to numbers 41 and 39 to 40 but it's clear that they front an older row of properties. Similarly, behind the 18th century facades of numbers 44, 36 to 38, and 32, there are older structures. And these conceal 17th century timber frames with brick nogging. The exposed internal frame of number 32 reveals the same evidence for a former 17th century facade as is still attached to the frontage of numbers 33 to 34. And you can see how shallow actually that facade is when you're inside. So um, it's probable that the entire row was remodeled and refronted in a similar style at approximately the same time in the mid 17th century. But behind the facades, there is evidence of um, older framing and uh, indeed at foundation level, um, older structures still. And it's clear that we've got diverse multi-period structures. Where the brickwork is exposed beneath the plaster, as we were able to see in 33, 34, um, yep, um, there's evidence for patching. And much of the brick itself, which Abbey Antrobus used uh, thermoluminescence, I can't say it, thermoluminescence dating on, proves to have been reused from late medieval and 16th century sources. So the brick, in between, the 17th century framing is reused. Now, there were, there were superficially similar forms of building elsewhere, most famously, perhaps, this row in Holborn, 
but it's not the same. Isn't that it? And uh, there were sort of continuous casemented windows in some parts of northern Germany. But the uh, continuous windows and that unique external decoration on those pilasters uh, is uh, what is of interest here. Okay. So now I want to think about this context uh, leading up to the, the Commonwealth of uh, Puritan interests and Protestant towns. In his seminal discussion of the English Protestant town, Collinson drew attention to the preeminent value that post-Reformation town governments in England set on establishing high-caliber Protestant lecturers in their towns, preachers in other words, in order that they might lead their populations in the true path of Reformed religion. And the Elizabethan divines promulgated the view that England was God's elect nation, specially predestined by God to defend his cause against Antichrist, who for them was the Pope. These precepts were pronounced from pulpits and circulated in printed sermons and in books the length and breadth of the country. So there are particular tropes about the elect and um, Protestant towns. And what is particular about Newcastle, I'm going to argue, is that they made it concrete. The reformed Protestant town stood before God, the one, as a seamless whole, containing no rival loyalties to various sub-deities, no rival jurisdictions, no religious liberties or enclaves, which were no-go areas for the civic authorities. The Protestant towns were idealised as the Jerusalem of Psalm 122, built as a city that is at unity in itself, as given in the English Psalter, or that is compact together in itself, as given in the Geneva Bible of 1560. Now remember, when looking at this, that phrase and the disunity, the architectural disunity behind the facades, the patching, the different dates. So for the Protestant divines of the late 16th century into the early 17th century, London was regarded as the Jerusalem of the English nation. But provincial towns could aspire to take a similar position in respect of their own hinterlands and regions. And Collinson explored the role of Protestant civic governments and magistrates in installing suitable lecturers and supporting the unity of belief which would make their towns stand as exemplars beyond their walls to the country beyond. And Collinson was concerned with the idealised role of the city as an agent of reform and the metaphorical seamless whole of its population. Here, I'm interested in a group of people whom it would seem took that a stage further to make it a more concrete application. I refer here and throughout to the Geneva Bible of 1560. And that remained the preferred translation of the Bible for Puritans in England, Scotland and New England into the 1650s. In the late 16th century, Scottish Calvinist exiles in Newcastle established a congregation on the Genevan model. Whilst the potential leader of the Puritan cause in England at this time, Whittingham, was appointed Dean of Durham. Whittingham, with the help of his brother-in-law, John Calvin, had been amongst the English exiles in Geneva who had translated the Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible has a marginal note explaining the meaning of the city that is at unity in itself, that is compact together in itself. It says, by the artificial joining and beauty of the houses, he meaneth the concord and love that was between the citizens. So I want to, to take you into some of the context out of which the interregnum Commonwealth uh, Puritans arose in this uh, city. In the period between the late 16th century and the 1640s, a small but important group of Puritans supported lecturers of their own godly views in Newcastle and held prayer meetings, secret conventicles, as the established church called them, in one another's houses. 
In general terms, the constituency of religious radicals overlapped with a group of merchants and their families who had been excluded from the traditional oligarchy of the town government, the common council or corporation. From 1601, political and economic power was concentrated in the hands of a few. Those who held a monopoly on the coal trade, the company of Hostman, the wealthiest merchants in the nine companies, the oldest established craft guilds, and the three merchant guilds, including the merchant adventurers. Together, they formed the inner ring. Many of these families were broadly conformist in religion, supporting the established church and the monarchy. Beyond this elite, however, there was a layer of successful merchants and masters from the lesser by trades, those guilds only grudgingly allowed to, to vote for civic officials in um, the times up to now. That group below clamoured to participate in government and to break the stranglehold of the inner ring. Many of the religious radicals were to be found in this group. On the eve of the Civil War in the 1630s to 40s, this competition for power could be characterised as one between a royalist, conformist Church of England elite and a frustrated parliamentarian, radical or Puritan aspirant elite. Now, in reality, the situation was less polarised, more ambivalent, and as de Groot observes, with far more subtle relationships between Puritan and royalist, Kingsman and parliamentarian. But the central Puritan religious figure... Oh, have I done? Yeah. In Newcastle was Dr Robert Jennison, a lecturer of Presbyterian Calvinist persuasion who came from a family prominent in Newcastle government. His father, Rafe Jennison, was mayor when he died in, in 1597. And Howell just ascribes the beginning of what was to become the Puritan leadership in the town during the Civil War period to Jennison's ministry. Jennison regularly preached at All Saints Church and Trinity House Chapel from 1611 onwards. He was regarded as a crafty Puritan by the established church, which harried him for his opposition to popish innovations, his belief in the salvation of the elect, and his participation in illegal prayer meetings in Newcastle. At one point, he was suspended for nonconformity and fled to Danzig in northern Germany in exile. The notion that ideal Protestant communities could be strived for on earth need not have been deemed unrealistic to Jennison at this time. He had held a fellowship at St John's College in Cambridge from 1607 when another Puritan, Peter Bulkley, was also a fellow. Jennison's closest religious colleague, William Morton, maintained a correspondence with Bulkley from Newcastle and Bulkley emigrated to New England in 1635 and founded Concord, Massachusetts the following year. So Jennison preached a number of sermons on a, uh, a particular theme that we'll be looking at, uh, subsequently published as The City's Safety or a Fruitful Treatise in These Dangerous Times in 1630. And in it, he addressed the respective roles of magistrates and ministers in creating a godly town, requiring each to fulfill the role of watchman at the city gate. Also relevant is this other treatise he wrote uh, on the, the plague and, of course, the, the plague being visited on people for their sins. It's actually been used very usefully in terms of the data it gives about uh, deaths at the time, but I'm interested in his sort of moral um, approach in this uh, work. Throughout much of the text of the city's safety, Jennison draws on biblical precedents for the siege and destruction of, divide, of sinful, divided cities, even those that considered themselves to be godly but were deceiving themselves through pride and misplaced confidence in their own salvation or election. Quoting Matthew 12.25, he wrote, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Which words show indeed the great benefit of unity in houses, cities, and kingdoms? Within nine years, 
of these sermons, a Scots army entered Newcastle, and within 14 years, the town endured a full-blown siege, and the houses, especially on the waterfront, um, were very badly affected. The words of the Puritan preacher must have held a dreadful resonance to those who had been present and remembered the dire warnings and to those who had pondered his printed words in the decade between. When the Civil War broke out, Newcastle was held for the king from August 1641. The town was besieged from July to October 1644 by Parliament's allies, a covenanting Scots Presbyterian army. Much of the standing fabric of the town suffered. Those monuments which these late wars have obliterated and ruined as Grey Road. The most significant consequence of the town's surrender to the Scots in both political and religious terms, however, was the complete downfall of the Royalist Party and the triumphant installation of the Puritans. The old party would be absent from the government of the town for 16 years during the interregnum. Parliament imprisoned those members of the Common Council and their supporters who had held the town for the king and placed Puritans in key positions in their stead. A new mayor, sheriff, officers of the corporation, new aldermen were to be chosen from the Puritan Parliamentarian Party. The godly had been told by Jenison, harden not yourselves against God's fear that you should, being called to repentance with Jerusalem, Look to the houses of armour to make up the breaches of the cities or town to fortify the wall. This new ruling elite believed that perfectibility was only in the gift of God through the predestination of the elect, but that scripture had laid down that responsibility for the care and guidance of the community rested with civic magistrates and officials as much as with ministers of religion. It was therefore incumbent on the officers of the city to try to follow scripture as far as possible to create a godly commonwealth. Time and again, the watchmen of the Bible were interpreted as civic officials and teachers of religion in Genesis' sermons. Ezekiel 33 describes the role of the watchmen, governors and ministers, after the overthrow of tyrants, which must have had a real resonance in the wake of um, the beheading of Charles I. I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and admonish them from me. The city's safety is based on the text of Psalm 127.1. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the keeper watcheth in vain. According to the marginal notations of the Geneva Bible, the phrase build the house should be read as govern and dispose all things pertaining to the family. The city is the public estate of the Commonwealth and those which watch and ward are, and are also magistrates and rulers of the city. Repeatedly, he states, the watchmen over the moral and spiritual safety of the town should be those who govern the magistrates, councillors, mayors, aldermen. The last 10 pages of the book are dedicated to the subject of the building of the New Jerusalem. He warns his audience that they must behave as the true church in order to have an undoubted right and interest to heaven and to your pla mansion places prepared for the elect. Him that overcometh, saith Christ, that is his sins, the world and Satan, will I make a pillar for stability in the temple of my God, which is New Jerusalem. He states further that it doesn't matter whether the city is in heaven or on earth, and that city of God would be located by a broad river with many streams. Now, as you know, Newcastle sat on a broad river, and in the 17th century, you could still see the many streams that ran from the top down to the river. Now, remember that pillar. Him that overcometh, saith Christ, that is his sins, the world and Satan, will I make a pillar for stability in the temple of my God, which is New Jerusalem. So now I want to um, 
Look at the people who owned, leased, and occupied the buildings in question in the 1650s, who had the rights and opportunity to remodel and refront those buildings, to show that they were all linked to each other and to the radical preacher Jenison. Now, there is a well-established method for researching who owned or occupied property um, in history through the examination of property documents like this, uh, deeds, leases, etc., going back through time. Um, so it's a, a case of going back through time. You don't need to worry about any of the detail of this. But these are our properties across the top, which we'll come back to, um, and time on the side. So it's a way of relating um, one owner to the, the previous one or the subsequent one, and you can move backwards and forward in time. Now, I know this is small print, and I apologize for that, but it was the only way I could get all the information on one slide. The linchpin of this, we're looking at a summary of the householders of the Sandhill properties through time, highlighting family, business, religious, and political relationships. In 1568 to 78, Bessie Surtees' house, 41 Sandhill, was occupied by Rafe Jennison, the merchant and mayor, and Margaret, his wife, who were parents of Jennison, the Puritan lecturer. The house was sold to one Rafe Cock in 1581, and it passed down through the Cock family until 1649, when it passed to Samuel Cock. This is the information beneath. Oop, for the use of Thomas Davison and his wife Anne, daughter of Rafe Cock. And there's a, a dated fireplace in the house with the initials of Tom Davison and Anne Cock, and the arms of Newcastle. Davison, Cock, and the Merchant Adventurers Company. And that was installed in one of the principal rooms overlooking the street. Surtees House passed down through the Davison family to the end of the 18th century. Millbank House, let's call him here, was leased to Roger Nicholson, the mayor, in 1588. In 1641, the house was occupied by Sir Lionel Madison, uh, the son of a sheriff, mayor, and governor of both the um, merchant adventurers and the hostmen. And he was sheriff in 1624 and mayor in 1632. In the 1620s to 30s, he joined Jenison with two other laymen to form the nucleus of the Puritan group in Newcastle. And he was related to other Puritans of the region. In 1639, his sister married the son of Robert Buick, the first avowedly Puritan mayor of Newcastle. And Buick was half-brother to the preacher Robert Jenison. Madison continued to live in the property from 1645, though it was owned by Sir Alexander Hall's sister, Barbara, who had married Rafe Gray or, um, in 1625. And Rafe Gray was nephew to both the Puritan lecturer, Jenison, and the Puritan mayor, Buick, and he became sheriff in 1628-9. So you're starting to see these family connections. Madison's brother married Rafe Gray's sister in 1649. A tenement was in the occupation of Mark Milbank, one of the top 1% of wealthiest merchants, and a Commonwealth alderman who had married Dorothy Cock in 1629. Milbank was one of the four elders who elected uh, to assist Jenison at St. Nicholas's Church in 1647. And although he was a moderate, he held off this continuously before, during, and after their interregnum. In 1665, Rafe and Barbara Gray sold the messages occupied by Millbank to Thomas Buick, merchant and houseman. In 1582, John Carr conveyed a loft, part of his dwelling in 39 to 40, Sandhill, to Rafe Cock. The tenement to the east was occupied by William Carr in 1649. William Carr was a coal merchant and alderman in the Commonwealth Council in 1654 to 5. He was a member of a committee formed between late 1655 and 56 to decide on the appointment of preachers to the town. And again, there's a dated fireplace within with the arms of Cock, Carr, Jenison, and the Merchant Adventures Company in the room overlooking the street. And Adrian Green has told us that the inscription of Orvermantles should probably be read as a visible sign not only of marriage, but also of the establishment of an individual household among the lesser elite in the 1640s and 50s. 
The inclusion of both the wife's and the husband's initials, he says, underscores the impression that rebuilding or substantial alterations to a house after marriage was an enterprise of the couple, despite the patriarchal restrictions on companionable marriage. So it was another form of concord. Numbers 36 to 38, Van Hill, and we are getting towards the end of this, were owned or occupied by Christopher Nicholson from 1649. And he sat on the parliamentary committee for sequestrations in the town after the siege of 1644. In other words, the committee that took the property, the wealth and the power off the, the former royalist uh, leading elite. By the 1660s, that property was in occupation of Robert Fenwick, a merchant who'd been responsible for petitioning Parliament for a Presbyterian government in Northumberland in 1645. Moving on, an indenture of 1650 regarding numbers 34 to 33, Sandhill, relates an agreement whereby Cliburn Kirkbride merchant and Francis Burton merchant effectively split the property between them. Now, Burton had been an apprentice to Christopher Nicholson. And again, uh, we're coming up with the connections with um, the committee that appointed the Presbyterian lecturers. Kirkbride's wife's name, Philadelphia, suggests that she came from a Puritan family. The indenture and the arrangements made between these two families perhaps gives the greatest expression of mutualism and concord in social relations amongst this already complexly interrelated group. So kinship, religion, capitalism are mixed through marriage, family and business. So in conclusion, and thank you for bearing with me through that, the owners and occupiers of these properties throughout the relevant period of the remodeling and refunding were demonstrate either of the radical party, sympathetic to their aims, or related to them through business and or marriage. All had some connection with Jenison, and would have been amongst the congregations to whom he preached, and amongst whom his printed sermons circulated. In the wake of the siege, appointed to govern by a victorious parliament, I believe that these people found the prophecies of their local lecturer fulfilled. More importantly, the godly reformation towards which he had exhorted them was possible now through a conjunction of circumstances, probable siege damage to some of the existing housing stock on the waterfront, wealth and now political power, and not least the homegrown coal-fired industry of glass making, window glass making, which the Commonwealth Council encouraged. Now there were other similar buildings uh, dotted around the, 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 certainly the lower town, some of which we can also determine to have been in the ownership of Puritans or Puritan sympathisers. So this brings me to the crux of the matter, the iconography. Now, if you remember, I talked about these pilasters, these window jams, having simple Doric bases and capitals. Tuscan and Doric were the classical ornaments of choice for Puritan, um, or pro-parliamentarian architecture during the Commonwealth. Following Vitruvius, Renaissance architectural writers considered the classical orders to have moral qualities, and Doric was a pr particularly appropriate for buildings for military or strong persons who would act as leaders and guides in directing the populace in a good and correct life. And Christopher Nicholson, who we've heard about was one of the leaders of the militia formed to defend the Cromwellian protectorate in the north, and Henry L Rawling was in the last militia of the protectorate. All surviving pilasters feature an illusion of column fluting formed not, as I said, by incised uh, grooves, but instead by spear-like decorations which stand proud, and in fact, they have points and they have tassels. And they appear to me to be lances or staffs or staves. Now, given the significance of the role of the watchman enjoined on the magistracy and government in Newcastle, it's tempting to interpret the unique fluting motifs on the windows and panelling as watchman staffs. Now, since the 13th century, Royal Writ established a watch and ward in every city, borough and town. 
according to the number of ha inhabitants. They were to keep the watch all night from sunsetting unto sunrising and arrest any stranger abroad without good reason. Initially, they were not paid and all men in the town were expected to volunteer for this duty. They would be organised by the town constables. Um, the wealthier town dwellers often paid others to do their duty for them. Now, what happens when you no longer have royal authority through constables and you have your own authority in a period without kings? It passes to those watchmen, the magistracies, the aldermen, the Puritan elite. So these watchmen's staffs are variously depicted. Um, they uh, look like contemporary pikes. Um, they usually had tassels under the business end, the point. And that was, if you pardon the gruesomeness, to collect blood running down from the point so that it wouldn't go onto your hand and loosen your grip on the staff. So what does it mean that the sandhill tassels are at the bottom? I don't know. I, haven't, I, haven't, I don't know that yet. It may, these staffs on the pilasters may also have allusion to staffs of office. Almost all offices had rods, staffs of office of some sort. And this 19th century depiction shows the aldermen with their staffs. And this is in the interior panelling of some of these buildings, which again has the staffs with the pointy end and the tassel end. In Newcastle's call to her neighbours, Jenison describes the plague as God's chastisement upon the cities of London and Newcastle. He keeps the rod in his own hand and begins, as it were, at an end of us, smites some few, and so gives warning to the rest, hovering, as it were, and standing at our gates. Later, he quotes Micah 6, 9, The Lord's voice crieth unto the city, and the man of wisdom shall see thy name. Hear ye the rod, and who hath appointed it? This is God's voice as the rod of chastisement on his people. In the city's safety, Jenison exhorted the magistrates to look both outward to external enemies and inward to the internal enemy, but warned, Whatsoever may be conceived to be as a staff, strength, or stay to any place or city, it would do them no good if God deprived them of it. These were to contribute to the armour of the house of the forest, which fortified the walls of Jerusalem. Now, the full meaning of the Newcastle houses, I believe, can only be understood in terms of the space they helped to define, the sand hill and the occupants of that space, the souls whose moral safety the householders sought to maintain. The sand hill was an open space at which the principal streets linking the upper town and markets to the thriving riverfront converged. The opposite side of the sand hill was defined by the town exchange, merchant adventures, court and guild hall, combined in a tight complex of chambers in which the mayor's court, the sheriff's court, the court of sessions, the borough courts and courts of assizes were also heard. This was the heart of commerce, civic government and discipline. The Parliamentarian and Common Council took the decision to rebuild the complex in 1655, exactly the same time they're refronting the buildings on the other side. And the mayor's parlour in the new guild hall had windows which looked across to the houses opposite and onto the public space below. Now, in architecture, I believe this version of the guild hall was most akin to Dutch Republican buildings of the time. As a crucial thoroughfare and as a focus of so many institutions, the Sand Hill must have been a bustling hub where imported goods were weighed and assessed, where markets were held, where dues for anchoring and ballast were paid, and through which carriers moved their goods to the upper markets. The stocks for public punishment were located here, and it was ringed with shops at ground floor level of the surrounding buildings. The human occupation of this space, every day and seasonal therefore, represented a greater constituency than any single parish church or meeting house, any company house or market could have afforded. In short, this was the perfect location for the watchmen to mount their watch. 
Robert Titler has argued that the town hall or principal guild hall of a town in England in the early modern period may have been regarded as a metaphorical doorway or gateway into the urban community, not least because people signed their apprenticeship indentures in the guild hall and entered that social and economic community. With the houses of the new elite across the way, all the references to the watchman and the gate have a doubled intensity, given that thought. And indeed, the guild hall was linked to the waterfront stretch of the town's defences, which excavation has shown had been realigned deliberately about this time. So we can ask if this is deliberate placemaking by this Puritan-leaning elite, a Republican forum for Newcastle. For Jenison, the watchmen set upon the walls of Jerusalem shall never hold their peace day nor night, who yet watch not so much for as over our souls. The buildings, I'd argue, can be interpreted as a strategy towards the implementation of a godly reformation where the watchers have responsibility over the watched below as much as they place their own lives under scrutiny. And something more could be said here of the reciprocal nature of surveillance. Much Puritan writing emphasized this, the dangers of solitariness or of being too long or too often out of the view of others. And windows have complex puritanical meanings, one of which is that they are a way of making the self always available for inspection by others. And Henty Lowe told me that amongst some Dutch Calvinist communities, there was a belief that one should not close the curtains of the front room of a house looking onto the street in order to show that one had nothing to hide. Now, the Newcastle windows were of a far greater extent than those traditionally employed in the north of England and not only allowed greater visual access to the street below, but admitted greater light into the interior of those houses. In an address to the Lord Protector in 1653, the Common Council of Newcastle referred to the watchtower upon which they had mounted in order to discover God's design for them. They felt that they were fulfilling the prophecy in Isaiah, I will make thy officers peace and thy exactors righteousness. And this watchtower reference is made even more obvious if we try to reinstate the original projecting bays that existed on some of these houses that must have looked like the projecting towers of city walls. Now, those missing projecting bays, say bay windows generally, add functional luminosity with spying potential. So again, the watchtower aspect comes to the fore. And there were many more of these that we have now lost, some on pillars, some not on pillars. Jenison made several references to Solomon and his temple when he reached the section of the sermon concerning the building of the new Jerusalem. As we have seen the elect, will I make a pillar for stability in the temple of my God, which is new Jerusalem. And we've noted some of the houses had these projecting bays supported at pillars, a street level. Now, Jenison did not describe the temple in his sermons, but personally, when we look at the frontages of the Newcastle houses, he did talk about the house that Solomon built after he had completed the temple, which stood upon cedar pillars and cedar beams, and the windows were in three rows, and window was against window in three ranks. I hope to have shown a striking consonance between the form and decoration of a group of merchant houses built during the Commonwealth period in Newcastle and sermons preached on the theme of the godly city in the same town just a few years earlier. The houses were owned and occupied by a group of families who took prominent roles in civic government during this period of social revolution. The families may well have chosen to live in close proximity to each other initially in order to provide mutual support when it was unsafe to be a radical in religion. After the Civil War, they were safe to be openly Puritan, and in the light of the sermons preached by their religious leader, Jenison, they chose to demonstrate their concepts of love and concord between citizens through their choice of house frontage. 
The frontages gave the impression of units harmonized together as a whole without eradicating recognition of individual households. And any external elements or family heraldry were emitted and kept for the interiors. According to the sermons preached by their religious leader, they were now not only safe to worship freely, but they were also literally the town's safety, so that now any proportionable number of just men in a city shall be the safety of it. Encouraged by exegesis on selected biblical texts, they assumed the role of moral and spiritual watchmen over the souls of the townspeople. The form of house they chose, I argue, with its extensive windows giving on to the public space of the hand, sand hill, allowed them to maintain a real watch over the behaviour of townspeople, a practice endorsed by the fact that so many of the householders held offices connected with law enforcement and discipline. And these roles were symbolised in the staffs or rods carved on the house facades and some of the interior panelling. The urban space of the sand hill was defined anew by these merchant houses and the Commonwealth Guildhall. And unlike the grand ceremonial compositions of mainland Catholic Baroque Europe, the houses which line the streets were not just theatrical backdrops, but integral to the calling of the individual householders and their interactions with other members of the town population as watchers over their moral safety. Now, allowing for the missing projecting towers of bay windows, which I couldn't fit in, what might the ambition of this group have been? What might they have produced if they had not lost their power and ascendancy with the res restoration of Charles II in 1660? And had they been able to persuade more people to join them in their endeavours? So thank you. <laughs>